I am calling this hearing to order. For the record, my name is Sonia Fernandez Anderson, District 7 City Councilor. I am the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Ways and Means. I am joined this morning by my colleagues, Councilor uh, Louis Jean, Councilor Bach, Council President Flynn. Um, this hearing is being recorded. Um, it is being live streamed at boston.gov forward slash city dash council dash TV and broadcast on Xfinity Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, Files Channel 964. Today's hearing is on docket 0295, a message and order for a hearing to explore municipal bonds and other financial options to increase affordable housing and community investments. We will be taking public testimony at the end of this hearing. If you are interested in testifying, please email ron.cobb, that's R-O-N dot C-O-B-B at boston.gov for the link. We are joined this morning by our uh, administrative, um, well, uh, Justin Starrett, CFO, Jim Williamson, Budget Director, and Maureen Gersol. First Assistant Collector Treasury, welcome. To testify on this docket, um, I think I'll turn over to the lead uh, sponsor on this for the opening statement so we can keep it nice and sweet, nice and short. Uh, thank you so much, Chair, for um, holding this hearing. Um, and I also just want to thank my co-sponsor, Kenzie Bach. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Ruth C. Uh, at-large city councilor, and really excited and grateful to have the administration here so we can talk about uh, the city's bond policy. Um, I think it's really important. We know that the city sells bonds to uh, fund the things that we need, construction, supporting uh, buildings uh, in our schools, and thinking about how we're using um, our bond policy to do the investments that we need to do in all of our neighborhoods. Um, it is not because I have some deep, deep love for bonds or care about them or understand them um, in a deep, deep way, but I have enough understanding to know that they're integral to how we are, uh, how we decide uh, where we're putting our investments. And um, I think leaning into our fiscal strength, the eighth straight year of us getting a AAA bond rating, um, can have a monumental impact on a lot of our neighborhoods, on a, on a lot of our neighborhoods. Um, Something that, you know, has always surprised me and struck me is that we, we do tout this really great standing that we have, um, but what does that, how does that translate to our neighbors and to our neighborhoods and to our residents and, and do they understand the impact or do they feel the impact of what that means, you know? A, a, lot, of, a lot of that is the success of Boston's economy and its management. And, um, I think leaning into uh, our fiscal prosperity, leaning into what we do well, can lead to shared prosperity for all of our uh, for all of our residents. A lot of us are here because we have amb an ambitious agenda and a mandate, really, to bring equity to all of the spaces that we that here in the city. And I think our fiscal policy is is definitely one of them. So I'm excited as a new councilor to learn about uh, our debt policy and to see where uh, what we can do to to strengthen investments when it comes to affordable housing, when it comes to infrastructure, especially in neighborhoods that have been forgotten. So um, where, where, where are the pressure points and where can we, can we do more? Um, so I thank the administration for being here. I think, again, my co-sponsors, uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson and uh, Councilor Bach. I know last year there was a hearing held on specifically on green and social bonds uh, by the, po was it the Post Audit and Oversight Committee? Um, I think it was Michelle, the mayor. Well, it, was, it, was, it was me and the mayor. Okay, um, and so I'm excited to sort of have a more expansive conversation around that. Um, a, a few of our colleagues, newer colleagues, um, are, are not able to make it, but I know are very much interested in sort of learning more uh, because we, you call on us to authorize uh, issuance of bonds, and it's important for us to have a better understanding of how we can use those bonds um, to, to, to do the important work that we have here as a city. So thank you so much for being here. Councillor Bach. Sure, thanks so much, um, and thanks to uh, Councillor Lujan and to you, Chair. Um, it's exciting to have so many uh, allies on this front on the Council, um, and as, as was just alluded to, to uh, know that there's also an ally in the Mayor's office on thinking about how to do more of this. Um, I, I guess what I want to say is, you know, I think that the City of Boston has made major strides in recent years towards opening this conversation about bonding for housing. 
Um, I, I want to thank Chief Sarah for his leadership. As we all know, he's leaving us soon. Um, but uh, you know, in addition to being part of uh, a major part of making sure that we've had that AAA for the last eight years, um, he was also responsible for getting housing into the city capital budget for the first time in 2019. And I think we've continued to build on that strength over the last few years, really recognizing the fact that housing is one of the core public needs of the city, along with a number of other things that we support in the capital budget. Um, and as was already alluded to, you know, having that really successful uh, first formal green and social bond offering in November, December 2020, um, I think that uh, there's a bunch of respects in which Boston is leading the way here. I do think, however, and it's gonna be the sort of thrust of my line of questioning in this, that the place where we are not leading the way is on scale of bonding for housing compared to what the West Coast is currently doing. Um, and I think that we in the West Coast face a very similar challenge at the moment, these high cost cities with just insane housing demand. Um, and you know, if you look across Portland, San Francisco, Los Angeles, all of them in the last few years have issued close to or more than a billion dollars worth of bonds focused on housing. Um, so it does seem to me like we've planted the seeds, um, but it's kind of time for them to start cracking open. Uh, and I hope that this hearing today can be a, a sort of like grounding for um, that work going forward and thinking about what would be possible on a grander scale here in Boston. So thank you so much. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Uh, Councilor Flynn, if you have any opening statements. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the leadership of Councilor Lujan, Councilor Bach, and, and to the Chair as well for the important work. But I also want to recognize the Mayor's um, financial team that's here as well for their, for their work. And, keeping Boston strong and fiscally healthy and responsible. And that strong planning and discipline has been going on for 30 years in this city. But I remember when I was, when I was younger, as a young, young kid, when there was Prop 2 and a half and Boston was closing um, police stations, fire stations, we were laying off firefighters, parks employees, because Boston's um, <clears throat> fiscal health was not strong, but it was strong management, strong leadership from people like Jim and, and, and Maureen and Justin over the years, their previous predecessors as well, um, that have kept Boston on strong footing, financial footing, during good times and bad times. So just want to highlight the, the work, not, not just of the mayors, but the people in the financial that do the financial work in, these, in, the, in, the, in the budget office, the financial office. So I just want to say thank you to them. But this is an important discussion. And, and, and what, what, I would ask, um, what I would ask Jim and Maureen and, and Justin is to explain it very um, clearly so everyone can hear, especially for people that are watching on television, because I know they will want to um, know exactly what's happening. So, Again, just want to say thank you to my city council colleagues and to the um, and to Mayor Wu's financial team that's here today. Thank you, Council Jen, and thank you, Council Hassan and Council Bach. Thank you, Council Flynn. Uh, Councilor uh, Braden was not able to attend, so I just uh, allow me to read um, her statement into the record, uh, dear. Chair Fernandez Anderson, please be advised that due to a schedule conflict, I will not be in attendance at the Committee on Ways and Means. Hearing docket 0295, a hearing to explore municipal bonds and other fiscal options to increase affordable housing and community investments scheduled for Tuesday, April 5th, 2022. I would like to express my support for the committee's inquiry into ways city leaders might leverage the financial health of the city toward a shared prosperity for all residents. My staff will attend the hearing to take notes and I look forward to reviewing the committee report. I ask that you please read this letter into the public record. Thank you. Sincerely, Liz Braden. Thank you. We've now been joined by um, our colleague, Councillor Mejia, right on time. If you um, do have an opening statement, we can go right to you. If not, um, we can keep moving. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Good Sorry morning. for my tardiness. Um, thank you, Chair. And to the makers, I'm here to ask questions. 
Make sure you guys get this right. Um, now, uh, all jokes aside, I think this is an exciting um, opportunity for us to think outside the box in terms of how we can address our, our housing crisis here in the city of Boston. So making sure that we do so in a way that is financially um, responsible. So here for all of it. Thank you. Thank you, Council Mejia. Um, without any further delay, we'll go straight to the panel. Um, uh, Chief uh, Starrett, uh, is that, that's not, is that you? No, it's CFO. Yeah, it's Chief. It's Chief. Thanks. Uh, Justin is fine. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that's why, that's why uh, Bach is here. So, uh, please, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you to the sponsors of this uh, uh, order, and thank you for counselors for being here. It's an exciting time, and, and I do appreciate um, really the points that were made in the opening comments. I'm just going to jump on two of them before I turn them over to the experts. Um, Councillor Flynn, to your, to your points, it is really the a &F professionals who work behind the scenes and who have worked here for decades who have built up that a &F strength and that fiscal strength, and that's people like Jim and Maureen who really are the stewards on a day-to-day -day basis of making sure the city is meeting its obligations and is budgeting accordingly and is um, really leading the way when it comes to securing that AAA bond rating. So I want to recognize them and, and certainly thank them for their work, and they'll certainly do the bulk of the presentation today. Um, the second piece I want to just quickly talk about is, is how this is a the bond and the city's ability to sort of borrow money is a tool in tool belt, right? It is not going to solve every problem and is not going to be able to fund billions and billions of dollars, but it can be better used and it can be utilized to, I think, accomplish a lot of the shared goals around prosperity and certainly around one of the most pressing crises facing the city. And frankly, the city's competitiveness going forward is housing and how do we better use our resources both within our existing authority and then what do we think about for you know, whether we need changes at the state level or whether we need to reprioritize uh, amongst the city budget about using um, all of the city's resources towards housing as an investment opportunity. Um, and I really think that there's opportunity there. One of the points that I think we're most proud of in the sort of ANF cabinet is during the most recent um, sort of economic downturn in previous administrations and in previous sort of um, sort of fiscal situations, the city would typically look to the capital plan and look to the bond authority and actually cut that as part of the annual budget in order to avoid layoffs, in order to avoid service and program cuts. I think one of the things we're most proudest of in the last couple of years is not only were we able to maintain services and maintain investments in our core programs, we're actually able to grow the capital plan considerably over the last couple of years. Yes, not all the way to our limit, but we are on a path to get there, and we're excited that um, we can take this going. We can take this going forward in a place where we're not sort of starting at a, 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 a sort of a limited ability of capital spending. We're actually just issued our largest ever um, bond offering last week uh, of about four hundred million dollars, which we're very excited about. So um, I'm going to turn it over to the team. We're going to uh, Maureen Garceau, head of Treasury for the city, and Jim Williamson, Budget Director. We're going to walk through a brief presentation to really set the framework, and then really um, look forward to diving into the questions. So I'll turn it over to them. Thanks, Chief. Okay, uh, uh, thanks so much, Councillors, for sponsoring this hearing. It's a very important topic, and we appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to jump right into the, the debt policy overview. So uh, as, as Councillor Louis-Jean had talked about, we, we uh, as the administration, need to come to the City Council to get approval for our bond authorization. And uh, cities and towns in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts are, are authorized to, to borrow under certain state statutes uh, payable within a certain period. And uh, debt, you know, is a very, very long, it's a long-term commitment, it's a serious commitment. Uh, but it's, but, um, you know, it's a financial tool to uh, implement city services as well. So, uh, it's so important that the authorization requires two votes of the City Council, two weeks apart. And that, that uh, encourages opportunities for people to, because it is a long-term commitment, to, um, to, to take that time. So, two votes, two, two weeks apart, and then approved by the Mayor. So, then I'll be talking about debt limits and debt capacity. So uh, to be a participant in the bond market, the municipal bond market, you need to have a credit rating. And a credit rating is, you know, I think in our, in our uh, listening session, in the recorded session, we talked about a credit rating for a city is very much like a FICO score for an individual. It's credit worthiness. What, how are you, how responsive and responsible are you as a fiscal stewards to be able to pay back that debt? Because bondholders, that's one of the, they, they want to make sure that you're insured to pay those back. So uh, you need to have a, 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 credit, a credit rating to participate. And what credit rating agencies consider is your debt and liabilities, which includes
pensions and your, you know, the, the debt service you've already committed to. Um, and in direct and indirect, like outstanding debt, uh, cash balances, how, you know, your, just your ability to be able to re you know, pay these, this debt back. So uh, the FY, you know, we'll be bringing the FY23 uh, budget and the FY23 to 27 capital plan to you very shortly, but in the existing capital plan, uh, we have $1.58 billion planned to be borrowed over that period. Uh, it's, you know, uh, north of $300 million a year, as, as Justice just said, we closed the deal even higher than that. Um, and the, the level of, uh, well, uh, debt issuance as planned through this, this plan that we released last year will get us to close to 7% by like 2026. Um, and then debt, pension, and OPEB charges, these are your long-term liabilities. These are, these are expenses that you're committing to uh, for, the, for the long term for the city. Uh, we're, we intend to be fully amortized in, on the unfunded pension liability by 2027. And we have uh, stepped up and in, in continue to make an annual payment into uh, an irrevocable trust for OPEB, uh, in, you know, awaiting further guidance from, uh, about establishing a long-term schedule for that as well. So with that, we can go to Maureen and talk about debt policy overview. Thank you, Jim. Good morning, all. Um, just to follow up a little bit on what Jim said, um, we in Treasury maintain a debt policy. Um, it was sent to, a PDF of it has been sent to your offices. You may not have received it yet, but it, it's in your inboxes, if you will, so that you can review it in a more detailed level. Is it this but, or something? Is it something else? Or is it so there's an actual document for of the debt policy. So that was sent just shortly before this meeting. Um, so it, it, it's a detailed policy that gets um, goes back probably to the Menino administration and um, was refreshed in 2021. And a couple highlights of it, of the debt policy, are, is the um, rapid debt repayment, um, which is something that we strive for because the, the tenants in the debt policy assist us in maintaining our AAA rating. So rapid debt repayment is one of those things that is looked at, and you'll see that 30, 35 to 40% of, um, of our debt is repaid within five years, and 65 to 70% is repaid within 10 years. Additionally, the um, limit on debt issuance, the 7% is listed in our policy. That conservatism assists us in our, in our rating. So those are two of the highlights that are listed in our debt policy. Um, because there is that, additionally, as, as Jim mentioned, there is that relationship to our debt, to obviously to our debt service payments. So when you have debt service payments, it affects your cash balances, your fund balances. So those are also items that are looked at for our AAA rating. So th those were just a couple highlights that we wanted to put in the debt policy, uh, to mention with regard to the debt policy. But it, it, it should be in your inboxes. You can review it in a more detailed Fast. Maureen, if you don't mind, w one thing I would add, and just for context for, for those who may be at home, when we talk about our debt, we talk about our bond rating, it's not free money, right? We have to actually pay for it on an annual basis as part of the annual operating budget, which is about $200 million currently, um, and it's sort of a, a pretty big expense that we have on our annual budget, and that's in place of other services or other programs. So it's important that when we talk about sort of our ability to borrow and our ability to sort of borrow more, it is done in a way of, it's a zero sum game with other priorities on the operating budget. So it's, um, well, we think there is opportunity and it's certainly something that we are committed to um, paying back as, you know, in a, as, as Maureen mentioned, in a quick way, um, sort of the idea um, that we could sort of borrow more without other trade-offs is unfortunately one we'd have to have a conversation with the city council about. Ms. Garso, who sent that email? Excuse me, please. Who sent the email? Um, Jerrica Bradley. We, we haven't gotten anything. So I do know she sent it. I, I'm not sure to whom she sent it, but I'll ensure you have it by, yes. So I do know it was so, sent. Suffice to say, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of a 10 page long PDF. It's a Word document. It's pretty detailed. We'll certainly circulate it to you all, but it's not, uh, I think the highlights that Marie mentioned are included in here for today's purposes. In the deck, I should say. So 
The, the other things I just want to highlight is, again, our debt profile. Um, so, as I just mentioned, rapid repayment, 7% ceiling, and this slide shows that our outstanding debt service. So, given that we are paying it back quickly, given that, um, you know, right now we're paying the most in FY23 because we are paying down what we previously borrowed. So, if you look at this by FY41, you know, it, it appears that we have nothing. That's a, assuming we repay only what we've borrowed at this point. But this is just illustrative of our quick repayment, our 7% debt. Um, so that, that really was the point of including this slide, was just to show our debt profile. With that, I'm going to pass it back to Jim so he can uh, discuss the pension. Sure. Uh, so, so in addition to debt service, which is a substantial, um, you know, uh, requirement that the city budget um, pay for, pension is the, the, uh, another what we group in the category of fi fixed costs. Um, in as we, as we know, the current schedule is based on a valuation that was done January 1, 2020. Uh, it needs to be done every couple of years. So there's there's going to be a new valuation done uh, during uh, during the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, that will do, be values as of January 1, 2022. Um, right now, our liability is about, uh, outstanding pension liability is about 75.6% funded, uh, and that's city, city employees, uh, not excluding teachers, which is a responsibility of the Commonwealth, and we're scheduled to be fully funded by 2027. And then uh, the, the talking point in the, in the, the the approach to is once we've got uh, through the unfunded liability of the pension system, we will turn our attention to the unfunded liability associated with OPEP. Uh, and one of the things that with this valuation is is you can you can go from being fully funded to being not fully funded as you do evaluations in future years. So if if the if the, start, uh, if the market doesn't doesn't perform as you anticipated or other uh, phenomena occur, you might have to go back and try to get. Um, build back up that unfunded liability. So this is just a just a, a visual of the, the commitment that we've made over the, through 2027 for the pension schedule. Uh, in, in, uh, also, one of the things that's built in the pension schedule that also has some variability is uh, every year uh, the Boston Retirement System evaluates a, a COLA, uh, which is a cost of living adjustment for retirees. Uh, you probably get lots of inquiries from retirees about advocating to increase that, that COLA percentage. And then there's a base on which uh, retirees get a, a pension calculated off. And it was recently changed. It's up, it's up to $15,000 of the, of the pension is eligible for that COLA base increase. We can move into the... So, so before um, you, sorry, before you move on, Jim, just for those uh, at home, OPEB, our other pension, other post-employment benefits are basically our long-term health care costs for retirees, and that is a unfunded liability that the city has akin to uh, our debt service, which is our, our bonds that we we're talking about today, and our pension, which are things we owe to our employees. So I think Jim's point is that basically we have a good handle, an aggressive handle on getting those down, so I think that there are certainly, um, that those are all sort of uh, perceived as credit positives for the city, right? We're not, I won't name names, but there are other cities who have defaulted on their pensions, who have had to restructure them, who have had to, um, you know, file for bankruptcy, for lack of a better word, because of their unfunded liabilities. And the fact that we are so far ahead gives us a lot of, you know, um, breathing room to absorb some of those types of market volatilities, right? We lost, you know, I think the whole market was down 10 to 20% in the past couple months. So we feel like you know, as Jim mentioned, we're going to re do a revaluation this year. So obviously, we're going to see where the we go the rest of the year uh, as far as returns. But we feel like we are well far ahead on, on paying down our pension and, and OPEB liabilities. Sorry, go ahead. So this, this um, pie, two pie charts is sort of visual, visualization of the city's uh, FY22 capital plan. Uh, so on, on the left side, you, you could see how, how the uh, expenditures are broken out by, by department grouping. Uh, so our, our, our largest um, uh, borrowing is for, for st the streets cabinet, uh, then schools, and, and so on. And on, on the right, you can see the funding source. So um, what we're talking about is general obligation bonds for the city. So right now, that's 67.3 percent of, uh, of the current capital plan is funded via um, uh, bonding authority, and the rest are funded through, through 
federal grants, state grants, and other grants that we get um, um, it, that you guys have approved throughout the, the, the fiscal year. And with that, we can move on to the operating budget. So this is a, a chart that uh, you guys are, are, are very familiar with because it was uh, played at every uh, four, the, the four um, community listen sessions. Uh, you know, uh, to to uh, Councilor Finn's point, we're, we're really uh, working hard to make sure that this is consumable information by uh, citizens and they understand what's, what's in their budget and uh, in, in not always sort of talk about it in very technical and financial terms and to be uh, as straightforward and simple as possible. So this, this chart uh, uh, is the current um, city's operating budget and uh, we've talked about that uh, the, the 41 percent of our, our budget is dedicated to public education, and that includes both the, the district, the Boston Public School District, and uh, the assessment for charter schools, um, which are public schools uh, in our city. Uh, and, you know, just to, to point in one, so um, uh, bond debt service is, is built into the, the fixed cost component, and I think what just, Justin had highlighted that um, uh, we if, when you grow the size of your borrowings, you, you increase the size of your capital plan, you increase your debt service. It's, it's just like nah. your, your home, you know, <laughs> you, you get a mortgage on your home. Uh, if the bigger your mortgage, the less money you have for other things. But the other things in, the, in terms of the city's budget is things that are the bread and butter of what uh, our constituent services. So we have to be very mindful to have that balancing act, to, to focus on the long-term investments while making sure that the city runs day to day. Um, so, and just on the right side, uh, it's been talked about many times that in every, this is every city and town in the Commonwealth is very dependent on um, uh, property taxes to support its operating budget. Uh, we live in the phenomenon, as, as Council Flynn talked about, of Proposition Two and a Half. And it, but, but by the good grace of, of economic activity in the city, we've, we've been able to continue to grow from there. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back to Marlene. Great. I'm going to talk a little bit about our recent bond issuances. So first and foremost is our AAA rating. And, you know, as, as Councillor Flynn said, we're fortunate. We've had it for eight years. Um, and that enhances our buying power, if you will. And so it's important for us to, to maintain that because we, we get the, the best we can get. You know, if you have a, a to, to Jim talking about your mortgage, if you're credit rating is high, you can buy more. Um, so that's important. And, and the factors that are involved in, in our AAA rating, proactive financial and budget man management policies, um, as alluded to earlier, um, it's really the, the team of making sure that we're fiscally responsible, we're conservative, um, we're um, keeping our fund balances you know, within the thresholds, um, and a, an annually balanced budget. Um, you know, basic, what, what would seem to be basic um, tenants of a uh, F and A, um, A and F, whichever way you prefer, um, we maintain that and we do it well. Um, debt, pension, OPEB, conservative and on target. As Justin said, that's not the same for all municipalities. Um, that plays well for us in our, in our rating. The capital improvement plan um, to address our long-term needs, that's another um, tenant that is looked at for our rating. And, and finally, you know, as Jim said, our economy is strong, um, and that matters, obviously. Th the idea that we will have those incomes to pay back our debt. So th those are the, you know, four major tenants of our AAA rating. Um, to move on from there, I say that and I, it's not working. Um, I don't know. I can't move forward the uh, slide for some reason. But anyway, to move on from there, um, I just wanted to mention our 2022 series that, as Justin said, we just closed on. We had a par amount of 333 million dollars with proceeds of approximately 400 million dollars and again we we received a tremendous premium and that is because of our buying power so that you know 60 plus million dollar premium 
is, is partially accomplished through our AAA rating, partially accomplished through a very good market right now. It continues to remain strong. And these are um, general obligation bonds that um, of new, all new money. We had at, at the time looked at perhaps doing a refunding, but the market changed a little bit and, and that wasn't available to us at the time. But um, this is new money that will go into many of the needs of the city. Um, and on the um, next slide, we, we discuss what was included in there. So you'll see that it supports affordable housing in partnership with Boston Housing Authority. Um, there's funding for the Boston Public Schools, specifically um, Boston Arts Academy, Josiah Quincy Upper School, um, and upgrades at many of the schools throughout the city. It, there's also um, work being done to mitigate the sea level rise. Um, so included in this are improvements at Garvey Park in Dorchester, Malcolm X Park in Rochester, in Roxbury, um, as, as well as Langone Park in the North End. So again, trying to um, look at the many needs of the city. Um, and the, the final piece of that is City Hall Plaza, which will um, serve as a catalyst for civic and community engagement. So, um, a big piece of it, and but we're hopeful that it brings the people into the city. Um, to also wanted to include some conversation. Um, Councillor Brock brought it up at, earlier with regard to um, the 2020 series that was done in uh, December 2020, and there was a gr social component, and that was 35 million dollars for um, that was to support BHA, to support the housing, um, called out as a social component. As, as I just referenced in the 2022 series, there's also that housing component just not called out as a separate series. The, um, there was a green series of $32 million, um, Renew Boston Trust, Boston Arts Academy, Langone Park, um, and the BCYF Curley Community Center similar to the 2022 series, just segregated out as a um, green bond. So those were the highlights that I wanted to bring up in our recent issuances. And with that, we'll take um, questions as you have them. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. Gerso. Um, Councilor Lujan? Yes, thank you for that presentation. Uh, it was very helpful. Uh, I just have uh, a few questions, and, and again, I think it's probably rare among cities that we have this plan to have our pension fully funded by 2027, so that's a credit, right, to reasons that we have a strong rating is strong management and also things that are can be constant and have been constant in the city of Boston for quite some time is a very strong economy. And those things, I think, are the pillars of, of a very strong city. And it's because of our ability to have this fully funded pension by 2027. Um, it's like, well, what else aren't we doing to make sure if, if we're able to do that, that other big cities like uh, ours are not able to do? It's to me that's an issue that we can always be doing more. Understanding, of course, that none of this is free money. I don't think anyone mm -hmm. thinks it's free money, but a lot of us think that we can be leaning a lot more into our fiscal strength, depending on you know from different angles. Um, but something that I wanted to explain just for the record and for everyone, the difference between, Maureen, if you could, between the general obligation bonds and the green and social bonds that were issued, explaining like, the green washing of bonds and, and what is the actual difference when we're talking about green, you know, the type of bonds that we issue when it's green and social bonds and when we're just issuing general obligation bonds, which, you know, generally the same thing. But I think for new counselors and for folks who are new to this world and trying to understand it would be helpful for us to really understand that distinction. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so at a, at a million feet, there is no difference. Um, so we had a conversation yesterday with our bond council to this very effect um, because, and he used the exact phraseology you just used, the greenwashing of, you know, people are, many uh, municipalities are trying to package bonds and saying it's, it's they're green. And there, there's some concern in the industry that maybe we're trying too hard to, to package it as green as opposed to doing the green work. We are doing the green work of the city. Um, we are, we didn't separate it out. As I referenced, there's specific um, 
projects within the 2022. Um, there is a, an additional reporting requirement with the green bonds, but it isn't significant. It, it, we have done it for our 2020, uh, but we had a little um, conversation, as I said, with the council, uh, bond council yesterday, and he told a little story of a recent um, green bond sale that he, he's affiliated with, and that, that municipality received a call from one of the investors, and the investor thought because he made that specific um, investment, he could tell them how they should direct their funds. That's obviously going a little too far. So there's a little concern about the packaging right now, but the, the work is what's important to the city. So there really is no difference between a green bond and a general obligation bond. It, it is the project. Um, we were the first, I think, in, in saying this is a green bond and we were able to identify it as such. But at this point, council has decided that really it adds no value. Now, in 2020, it added a tremendous value to, um, to separate it out. The market said, we will, we will reward that and we will pay, you know, pay it differently. So at that time, we responded because our fiduciary responsibility said, we can get better rates, absolutely. This year, we weren't provided that guidance, that the rates weren't there, because as you referenced, there's this greenwashing going on that's causing a little confusion of what is really, what does green mean? Thank you, Ms. Grosso. Uh, Chief Sarah, did you have something to add to that? No, I was, I was just gonna add, the, the end goal of green bonds, housing bonds, sort of differentiating them is to get a better price, right? And it's sort of, the market is saying, we want you as a city, as a company, as a institution to be investing in whatever the um, sort of dynamics around that segregated bond is, and we're gonna reward you, as Maureen said, with a better price. The, the market in 2020, for the first time actually in municipal history and throughout the entire country, we did get a better price for sort of a regular uh, geo bond versus a green bond in the intervening two years. In 2020, you got a better price on the general obligation than on the green bond? So on the green bond than oh, okay, the general obligation. Okay, okay, okay. It was small, we did get a national award for it, but it was a, and it was a small price <laughs> difference, but it was one of the first times it had been demonstrated on a municipal level. But in the sort of past two years, I think it, exactly as you alluded to, there's been sort of a, a greenwashing, as, as everyone said today, and there's sort of like the market isn't quite mature enough to be rewarding those issuances um, as handsomely as I think it would be, you know, hopefully where the market's fully mature. Great. So just to follow up to that, as I think Councilor Block mentioned this as well, is that, you know, there are other cities, especially in other states like Maryland and on the West Coast that are doing specific targeted affordable housing bonds, but mm -hmm. I think that's in part because of their state regulated, their state laws require them to issue bonds a certain way. We never necessarily have to do that given our state law. We can be issuing these general obligation bonds that do the work of of being targeted towards affordable housing and of being targeted towards green infrastructure and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I, I, knock on wood, the, the only 13 people who have to vote on a issuance of general obligation bonds is the 13 people around this, this table. Um, that is not true for other cities and towns where they have to do, you know, campaigns and they have to do ballot questions and they have to get it voted on by the voters themselves. So I think we are in a unique position that we can act sort of quickly and strategically, but as you alluded to, we're also limited by what we can and can't borrow for from a, a sort of a, you know, affordable housing versus green versus regular sort of bond issuance perspective. There's, there's limits on what we can actually do on an annual basis within our existing statutes. Great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Um, and just so we're clear, that this is the body, the city council, we vote on the issuance of the general bonds, uh, general obligations bond, but it's in ANF, in the administration that really does, it, it, is, is, it takes the lead on deciding the policy around that, the 7% policy or, or whatever policy it is, or that, that even though we have this, you know, 7% ceiling right now, we're only, uh, it's only 5.3% of the city's operating budget, right? That, those are the policies that are set in ANF without necessarily income, uh, um, uh, input from the city council that's set by the administration. Is that correct? Yeah, so the city council votes on our um, authorization to go out and borrow. So, you know, as Jim mentioned, we'll be in front of council next week for another request to authorize borrowing on behalf of the city. 
the policies set forth by the city are a combination of, of yes, internal city policies built up over years, but also state law in what we can and can't borrow for and how much we, we do have a state limit on how much we can borrow as well, um, which is part of, which we are below, but which is part of our overall framing as well. Um, I, I wanted to get one thing sort of out of the way because I know folks have been asking me this question and others, just how does inflation in this moment in, uh, in time affect our ability to bond and how we're bonding? So if you could just address that to assuage any concerns or to address any, any issues that, that you may be thinking of right now. Well, I'll happily jump in and then defer to the gentlemen if they have more to add. Um, but no, it, it does affect us, right, because it's cost. So um, if, if you look, our 2022 um, total in cost was considerably lower than our, and, and I say considerably, we, we are still in very good times as far as rates go, but um, the Federal Reserve steps in and raises rates to, uh, you know, to um, try and ease some of the burden of the impacts of, of inflation. So with that said, we see a one-to-one, -one uh, it's an inverse, um, Correlation, but we see a one-to-one -one impact on our on our borrowing. So, I think it was in the 1.4 neighborhood in 2020, and it was 2.2 uh, 2. this year. So, obviously, an impact. But uh, we're still in very good times. We are going to see continued rate hikes, and we'll see where we are next year with what the costs are look like. But um, yes, inflation obviously has an impact. And, and I think from a construction cost point of view, that's actually where we probably see it the most on inflation is $400 million just doesn't buy quite as much as it did two years ago. And I think that's one of the things we struggle with is we're thankfully building $100 million schools now. And, and you know, if we're only borrowing, f able to borrow four or $500 million a year, we're just not making as much progress with all those other priorities that we have and, and all the other need throughout the city. Wouldn't that be an argument in light of inflation and in light of all the schools that we're trying to improve and all the affordable housing that we're trying to build and uncertainty in the market to potentially be a little bit more aggressive in sort of, and you said that a few weeks ago was our largest bond issuance, but still we, we have that policy of 7% that we're inching towards. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be an argument to be more aggressive in that area? Because we know what the market is doing right now. Yeah, um, it, it's both what does it mean for our overall um, city operating budget, right? Where does this fit into the pie and where are the trade-offs that the administration and the council are willing to make in, in order to pay for that extra debt service? And then how does it affect our overall rating? And I think, I think there is opportunities to look at it, um, but I think we would want to test that with our rating agencies and, and obviously have a good story. I totally agree, the, the sort of the competitive advantages that the city has, right? Being a city that um, you know people want to live and work in and relocate to and, and spend money in and, and do that is in jeopardy if we don't you know make strides on our housing, make strides on our climate change. So there's always a balance between sort of yes, a dollar today is actually maybe a good credit positive for us because we're going to protect our sea, our coastal area region. We're going to invest in keeping people here. So I do think there's trade-offs. It's just a matter of of how the market views it, and that's just something we can't predict um, before we get to it on an annual basis. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate that. And I also appreciate the mentioning that, like, we could also potentially test if, if we're going to make any big sea change. It sounds like there is a mechanism mm -hmm. to actually go to these rating agencies saying, we have a deep affordability crisis, we have deep inequities, and we're trying to be a lot more aggressive. What if we made this change mm -hmm. to this policy? Would that affect where we stand? You know, and I know it's not an apples to apples co comparison, but there are a lot of municipalities mm -hmm. with higher debt service uh, as part of their operating budget that also maintain a AAA bond rating, right? Um, my last question before the chair makes me stop talking and moves on to someone else is uh, the debt policy overview, which I think is on page five of the presentation, which I uh, thank you for including. Something that piqued my interest is that, it, it, and when we get it, we have not yet received it, the, the, the debt policy uh, statement, but that we're on a rapid debt repayment schedule that uh, the city still structures the overall debt repayment so that at least 35 to 40 percent will be repaid within 35 within five years and 65 to 70 percent within 10. That sounds to me very aggressive and I don't know if other cities are on this repayment schedule. I just think about like we alluded many times to like a mortgage you know that's deciding to pay off your mortgage very aggressively 
Um, and that means that that's going to be a higher percentage of your operating cost of your yearly budget when potentially that money, you know, right now it's 5.3%, but if we didn't have such an aggressive schedule, perhaps that would decrease to about three, four, five percent or something lower, and then it opens up more of your, uh, more of the city's budget to do things like public works in neighborhoods that we often forget, like Roxbury and Mattapan and High Park and Dorchet, parts of, you know, and so I'm just thinking, you know, what is the rationale behind this rapid debt repayment? What are other similar muni municipalities doing? Is it, you know, level, level payments over time, or is it this rapid debt repayment? And is there room there to, to really explore? explore that, and then that's my final question until we move on to other folks. Yeah. Well, I was gonna say, definitely room to explore. Every municipality is different, right? They're gonna, they're gonna structure their debt differently. I think, I, I think about what Jim said at the beginning. You know, when you take a vote on debt, you're, you do it twice because you're committing the city to something over 20 or 30 years that are long gonna outlive, you know, maybe the folks in this room. So I think there's a, a hope and a, and a sort of concern that if you commit the city to that longer term, you know, debt payment, that you're sort of tying the hands in a lot of ways of future generations of Bostonians who, you know, if you commit the same way your mortgage, if you push it all up to the back end, you're sort of very, you're limiting a lot of what their opportunities are for, for their own choices in the future. And maybe the, you know, maybe the investments you make today will certainly be, hopefully be around at that point. You know, if you're building a building, you're hoping it's going to be there for at least 30 years. Um, but you want to make sure that you're not, you know, really tying the hands of future generations. Um, and then as Maureen alluded to, it also is a credit positive that the, the rating agencies like to see that you're committed to paying it back in a short time period, so you're not sort of kicking the can, for lack of a better word, down the road to future generations. I, I would echo that. I, I would say that that's, you know, that's definitely what we've seen. I, we have conversations, um, you know, every three years we look, go out and, and look at um, our financial advisor. And, and we put our debt policy or tenants of our debt policy uh, before them and ask, you know, for any potential guidance of um, are we doing things well, are we doing things, com you know, well compared to our neighbors, if you will. And um, we have not received any guidance to either speed up our policy or slow it down or raise our debt limit or decrease our debt limit. So um, the guidance we're receiving from our FAs, from our financial advisors, indicate that we are doing right. Certainly the guidance we're receiving from our um, rating agencies of a AAA, you know. So that, again, we're conservative and we, we play within those bounds. Thank you. Um, it seems that pretty much it's simple. The more you borrow, the more you're in debt, all the answers are the same, right? We're trying to make sure that the future, or at least that we don't set up the people, the future of Bostonians, um, in a way that they have to worry so much about debt. Obviously, interest increasing or how, whatever it looks like, but are you able to actually make projections in terms of like, in increments of 0.5% up to a certain amount um, or, or borrowing power? What what? What does that look like? Do you need to come back with that, or do you, have you already explored that? Um, we do explore it. Uh, Jack Hamlin, our director of capital, who's, who's with us, who is the sort of architect of a lot of our capital plan. Um, you know, we think about bonding not only in the five-year capital plan, but we do think about it in the 10 and 20-year window by which we're borrowing. So we do make long-term projections around how much we think we'll have access to, both under the existing policy, but also we were to adjust the policy. So we could certainly get that, that information and bring it back to you in specific terms. But broadly speaking, you know, we borrow, as Jim mentioned, somewhere in the neighborhood of like three to four hundred million dollars a year. If we were to sort of increase it to either go to eight percent or nine percent, you would unlock roughly fifty to hundred million dollars more, depending on sort of how much how long you're looking to spread it out and sort of how um, what the levers are that you're pulling in terms of how quickly you pay it back. But you're talking about sort of a bit on the, I don't want to say on the margins, because 50 to 100 million dollars is, is serious money, but it's not, you know, doubling it, right? So it's sort of um, within the context, not, um, not, not that different than what we're sort of currently planning. I see. I, it, it's almost as though the conversation is really after we look at those projections, right? Then understanding, does this make sense, mm -hmm. right? Because we already know what can be done, it can be done. Um, 
But I, 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 I have nothing further. I'm going to go on to uh, my colleague, Kenzie Bach. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'll, I'll pick up there. Um, I, I feel as though um, I, this is a theme I've been on before, and maybe this is a query that we can come back to in the Capitol hearing in a couple of weeks. Um, but it, it seems to me like the reason that we, you know, we do these projections for what would hit the 7% threshold, and then as Councilor Lujan alluded to, we're, we're below that, right? Um, and that's because of project delay factors. It's because we say we're going to spend the money on this number of projects, and you all don't actually issue bonds without being able to tie them to a project that is truly actually happening. And every year, we have a certain number of projects that we thought, in good faith, we're going to get pulled off that fiscal year, and they just don't, right? And we all know that there are some of those um, that hang around for multiple years, um, and then some where it's just a couple of months slippage or whatever. Um, I've never really understood why we don't, therefore, factor some kind of project delay factor into our projections and basically sort of like over budget capital knowing that, uh, you know, we're shooting for the moon and we're going to land among the stars. Because um, I just feel as though, and I'm not saying that we should be so aggressive, you know, if we're trying to stick to the 7% policy, and there's a whole conversation about whether that should be 8 or 9%. Um, but I sort of start from the frustration that it's not actually effectively 7%, right? Um, and I think that um, that's been a little bit masked historically by the fact that the council ends up looking at charts like the one that you presented today that looks forward at what our debt issuance will be if we hit what we're budgeting for, but doesn't always look back and say, hey, what, what did we end up doing in the last few years? And, and it feels to me like if we actually looked at what we did in the last few years, and, and I want to give the team credit, that number of effective borrowing has bumped up in recent years. I mean, you've definitely managed to get closer to um, the actual representing the projected, mm -hmm. but there's still like a significant gap. Um, and it just, it feels to me as though, much like a school that's accepting students and trying to make sure that it's gonna have the right class size sort of looks back 10 years and says how many people accepted us and who turned us down. It feels as though we could factor some kind of del like project delay factor in based on a rolling five year average or something, mm -hmm. and therefore give us like a bit more bonding room even inside of the current policy. So I'm just curious, and that seems intelligible to the rating agencies, like a thing we could explain. So, so I just, I'm curious if you guys could address that idea. I think that is, you know, uh, factored into how we sort of plan for projects is an assumption, uh, you know, that, that projects, and projects uh, legitimately take uh, some time. You know, if you're, even if it's uh, implementation of a park, there's going to be community meetings. People are going to want to participate and decide what type of equipment is placed there. Uh, when, you, when you magnify that by a larger, you know, master plan sort of, uh, there's going to be that process built into it. But I, I completely agree. I think we do that to some extent. Uh, it's not an exact science to say when a project that, you know, could uh, encounter some sort of um, a process slowdown. Uh, could be permitting, could be any number of different things that interfered with sort of the, the planned uh, execution of the, of the project. But uh, similar to how, how we size the operating budget with the assumption that like not every position is going to be filled in every single day of the year, there is that assumption. Uh, that sort of estimate in project scheduling to try to try to hit that uh, target so your, your borrowing is in line with with your spending but but it does seem to me Jim like we are consistently a bit under target so we could in theory move it up a little bit if we wanted to be more aggressive within the current policy so we have so you're you're right we have made strides in recent years to move the projects forward. It's both from a project perspective, but also a city's ability to um, deliver perspective. Just departments are not necessarily set up to spend quickly to like make up those gaps on an annual basis, both from a contractor perspective, but also just a people to deliver the projects. And I actually think, um, not to get ahead of ourselves, you'll be sort of seeing hopefully some investments, I think both in this year's budget and the next year's budget around building that capacity so we have a better bench. The other factor in our projections is, you know, the, the how much we plan to borrow is based on both sort of that 7%, but that 7% is also based on how where we think the operating budget is going, right? So the operating budget fluctuates anywhere from, you know, 1% in a bad year of growth to 5 or 6% in a good year. Um, we make relatively conservative adjustments around that, you know, say 3 or 4%, and if we don't hit that, and we have planned to borrow for, we then have to pull the projects back. So I think there's some conservatism we build into that as well. 
because um, we never really want to get over our skis on, on sort of having a project in the pipeline that's ready to go and ready to break ground, and all of a sudden we have to kind of stop and say, hold on, you know, we can't actually start this project because we have to wait another year to borrow for it. So I think you're right. There's certainly opportunities to plan better, and I think we have made strides to get there recently. I think there's also capacity issues at departments that we're um, hopefully going to make some investments in, and then um, along with the city council. And I think there's a sort of natural, you know, planning perspective from a budget point of view that, that limits that ability to. Yeah, I mean, obviously I share the frustration with the places where in, you know, whether we're talking about PFD or parks where we just haven't had the project management capacity to get things across the line. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, like, you can go either way. If we, if we had more project management capacity and we got more of these things that we were budgeting for done at a more consistent rate, then that opens up space on the back end for new projects as opposed to these ones stretching out across time. Or we say, this is our current failure rate, mm -hmm. and uh, and so we're going to like factor that in. I just I think it feels to me like we were consistently landing on one side of this line, and something that put us a little closer to the line. It mm -hmm. wouldn't be a disaster if you know if we found that. I, I think the chances that we would not put the shovel in the ground on the project because it feels like what we would actually do is pull back one of the new things that we are proposing for that year. It just feels like there's space here to get a bit more aggressive. Um, and and I and I feel like when we talk about you know fifty or hundred million a year, like I mean that's sort of if we move up the official thing, but we're all we're kind of undershooting typically by that amount too. I mean you know so and it's just like when you add that up across ten years, when we talked about the build BPS billion dollars over a decade, right? That's what that is. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about, I mean I raised it already, right? But um, you know, we've got these, all these West Coast cities are, they've, I mean, it's like, I think San Francisco's done bonds for 910 million in affordable housing over the last seven years, LA for 1.2 billion over the last six years, Portland for 900 million over the last four years. So those are all on track to be more than a billion over, over a decade. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, obviously some of those, you know, popularly authorized ones, there's a component of that, that stuff we couldn't bond for because it's privately owned housing. But there's a significant component of each of those that is publicly owned. Um, and it just feels like if we were actually, it, sh it, it is not impossible to come up with a kind of decade scale strategy like, like the conversation that we had about the BPS school needs, um, but that it would involve uh, being a little bit more aggressive on these fronts. So I do sort of wanna, wanna push on, on that. Thank you, uh, Council Buck. Did you have a, thank you. I uh, just wanted to acknowledge that we've been, we were joined already by Councillor Worrell. Um, I apologize, I didn't see you there. Um, if you have any opening statements, if not, we'll circle back to you when it's your turn. Um, Councillor Flynn, do you have any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, again, thank you to Jim, Maureen, and to, and to Justin. Um, so I, just been listening to the conversation, and I know Boston has made great strides uh, retiring our debt. Looking, looking forward, when we see many city employees um, potentially retiring over the next five years with, with significant salaries and with the high cost of health care as well, does that also and then, and then factoring in, we're going to have to replace those workers. But does that factor in your planning and your thinking in terms of how fast we can retire the debt, knowing that we're still on the hook for significant pensions and for the cost of health care rising in the city? Yeah. <laughs> you're good, you're good now. Oh, perfect, thank you. Um, so it does, so on a, as Jim mentioned, when we revalue the pension, that's both from a what's in the pot perspective, but also one of the liabilities perspective. So we look at previous year's earnings, and that's a pretty good indicator of where salaries are moving, um, as well as the healthcare side of things where we're working with our PEC, which is again a, a sort of national model for both employee relationships and management of, uh, of our healthcare but also just a good way to um, sort of keep costs in line and keep costs growing at a consistent pace. So 
we work very closely with our labor leaders on that um, piece as well. So we, uh, we feel like we have that um, in a good place. I think the question is, um, you know, how does that balance with the other priorities that we have, whether it's in the capital plan or in the operating budget, and that's something that we, um, you know, are constantly rebalancing on an annual basis. The, you know, projected pension growth is something like 8 to 10 percent over the next five years just to stay on schedule. Same thing with debt service, right? Just to stay on schedule, we're projecting somewhere between 5 to 10 percent growth. So that 5 to 10 percent growth um, is outsized, is larger than the overall budget is growing, so it's eating up a disproportionate amount of the overall pie of new money that we have on an annual basis. So it's all about balancing those priorities amongst um, what is a lot of need across the entire board. When, when the national economy declined and the city economy declined in 2008, 2009, 2010, I guess, um, if that happened today or if that happened several years from now, what impact would that have on, I know what impact it would have on the bond rating. It, it could or, or, or may not have an impact on the bond rating, but it would certainly impact um, hit the capital budget, right? So are you planning for some type of, or thinking about that there's the possibility of some type of major economic downturn in, if there is an economic downturn, what is your plan? Um, I'll sort of echo what Maureen said, right? I think we're very bullish on Boston, right? We have a lot of natural advantages when it comes to our industries here, our retention of talent, the desire to locate here, even though we've, you know, even post COVID, we've seen a shift in how people are living and working. I still think demand is gonna continue to rise in Boston um, for development and, and is still gonna, um, values are gonna to continue to rise as they have, and as we've seen recently. Um, but that certainly goes into our thinking when, I think, when we think about five and 10 year borrowings, right? When we think about how much we think the operating budget's gonna grow, yes, we have you know, years that grow at five and 6%, which is pretty much as high as it can possibly grow. But we also think about what are those years when it's either gonna decrease or it's gonna grow at 1%, and that does factor into our modeling and how much we can borrow from, which is why we don't sort of plan to grow at a six to seven percent growth for the next ten to twenty years, because that's unsustainable. Um, but I, I do think that, despite the challenges that COVID and post, you know, post-COVID work is going to bring to um, real estate, I, th I think there's just such a tremendous amount of pent-up demand and desire to, to live and work in Boston. Uh, and I think it's all about you know using that demand and that desire to better serve its residents and the residents of the city. And I think that's what we try to do on an annual basis in the capital and operating budget. Thank you. And then I guess my final, my final question is the, the success of the Boston Public Schools is, is critical to the work you are doing, certainly. We need an educated, we need an educated Boston Public School system that's educating our children so that they're able to get these jobs in the booming economy and purchase a home. But when the school system is struggling, like it is now, I think everyone will agree it's struggling right now. Um, and the price of housing is almost out of the reach, out of reach for working families. What is the message or what are we doing to attract workers from the city that are, that are able to stay in the city, get a job in the city, buy a house in the city? How does that impact your thinking and your planning? It's a tough one. I, from a school's perspective, you know, I think we're, again, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, I think we are, um, the mayor is going to present a budget that reflects her, and I know the council's shared priority of investing deeply in our students, both from an operating budget perspective, but also a capital plan perspective. There's a tremendous amount of need. There are, a couple, there are jewels all over the city in terms of schools, and we need to get them the facilities that they need to um, really thrive and keep, keep families in the city, growing in the city. And I, and I think that you'll certainly see a, a renewed emphasis, I think, in next week's operating budget and capital plan on just that. Um, but it also takes a tremendous amount of daily um, you know, work with the school department and, and, and everyone to make sure that people know about those tools, right? I think what we've seen is a, is a drop in enrollment in the city, and that's both a you know, housing 
that's both uh, where the jobs are, that's both a, you know, a reflection of the schools, and I think that we need to do everything. And it's, it's, just, a, it's just as much about a budget question as it is about a, uh, a communication and policy perspective. Um, how do we make sure that we're, you know, families that, that live here or want to raise their kids here know about how good the schools are, and we need to find the resources to help, help them achieve their goals. Well, thank you, Justin and Maureen and Jim and the a &F team that takes these issues very seriously. So um, I know I speak on behalf of the council, but also the residents, thanking you for your professionalism and, and hard work. So uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Council Flynn. Just um, let's try to speed this up, especially in our answers, um, hopefully so that we can get the rest of the panelists on while you're here. Um, I think some cross-referencing will be uh, super important to this issue. Um, Councillor Mejia, you have the floor. Thank you. In the spirit of speeding things up, I will be um, within my five or seven minutes that I'm usually allotted. So I just have two questions. Um, in the hearing order, actually this might be for the maker, or maybe you all might be able to provide some insight. Um, in the hearing order, it is mentioned um, that we could possibly build um, 2,500 deeply affordable housing units to meet our quote unquote fair cloth limits. For the purposes of communicating a little bit more clearly, can you just help explain what a fair cloth limit is and how um, our limit was set? So just some clarity around that. Um, and I have, then my next question for you guys over here is can you talk a little bit more about the 7% debt ceiling? I'm just curious, how did we end up with um, a number of 7%? Uh, I think Councilor Bach and then the panel. Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll just speak quickly to the fair cloth uh, limit issue. So um, one of my interests in this as a sponsor um, is that the, the federal government limits every city and town in the country of how many public housing units they're allowed to have. Um, but Boston, actually, we got rid of a bunch of our public housing units, sadly, after that limit was set. And as a result, we're actually limited up at about tw uh, 12,500 units but we only have 10,000. And so we've got this huge wait list of families waiting for public housing, but we actually have federal authorization to get annual operating subsidies for another 25% of units. That's that number, 2,464. Um, the feds will come with the operating money for them, and they've recently instituted a program that makes that operating subsidy more su sustainable called RAD. But what they won't give us is the money to build and create them. And so it's always been like a nice theoretical, but not possible, right? Because the, because the federal government really retreated from capital support to the public housing portfolio. That's also a huge issue when you talk about the $1.5 billion backlog that the BHA faces on its existing um, stuff. But part of the reason that I'm so interested in how the city can bond for housing is that the type of, of housing that the city can bond for most clearly is public housing. And if we could bring those capital resources to the table to create some of those 2,464 units, then we would actually have a sustained federal stream for those. And so to me, it's like we should be thinking about our capital plan in conjunction with a plan to get to the cap. Thanks. And I, just, and I just want to add, right, there are a lot of cities that have surpassed their fair cloth amendment. So what they actually want is to repeal their fair cloth amendment so they can actually get engaged in more building. We're not even at that. So we're talking about the things, how can we be creative about using our bonds, right? Easiest is on public land. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot that we can be doing on, on the land that we own, but also in partnership with BHA. And so I think it's just one of those areas where, hey, here's an opportunity for us to lean into our borrowing, our fiscal strength. We're not even at capacity. There are things that we can do, even potentially with our repayment schedule, to really reallocate some of that money towards affordable housing, right? There are some things to me that seem like, you know, I'm not an ANF, so I'm a city councilor, but it, there are some things to me that seem like we can be doing a lot more to Councilor Box point. Yeah, Thank no, you. I really uh, do appreciate that explanation. I think it's important, especially for those folks who are tuning in, to understand, um, you know, what we're, what we're trying to push for here. And I'm just curious, when I think about quality of life, and I think about the fact that, you know, we invest on the things that matter. And it seems like when it comes to investing in affordable housing, this is just a no-brainer in terms of really making sure that people are able to stay here in the city of Boston 
we keep hearing that the city is very attractive and everybody wants to come here, but what's the sense of um, doing so in a way that's going to displace the people who have invested so much time and energy here in the city of Boston? So there has to be a level of commitment in making sure that how we're investing is to keep people housed here in the city of Boston. So I think I'm really excited about this. And then, so if you could just, I'm almost done. If you could just talk to me about um, the last question, then I'm done. I'm not rushing you at all. Um, I actually just gave you five minutes starting now. I'm done. You're good? Yeah. Thank you. Um, your he, second part, sorry. He just has to answer uh, my question, that's it. The second 100%. part? The, the 7%. So just to speak briefly to the 7%, um, the, the city's debt policy began during the Menino administration, and, and that that kind of magic number was, was initiated then. But we refreshed the debt policy regularly. The um, most recent uh, refresh was in 2021. And, and we um, work in, in partnership with our financial advisor, and again, to see does that make sense? Does that sound you know, appropriate to our needs? And, and also to make sure it fits within the city's uh, de debt plan for the city budget. So um, really, it's, it's historical, but it's refreshed frequently. Could it be moved? Could it, could it be altered? Could it be, is it, that's the limit? Is that all we? I, I think that's what Councillor Bach was alluding to earlier, that yes. Sometimes I need a translator, I don't want to yeah. speak. No, so, no, no I, think, I think that's what the other councillors have been alluding to is, if, if we raise the debt limit, and, and what does that mean? It means a greater impact on the budget, and, but you know, there's trade-offs. If we can even reach the 7% first, right? Correct. Or if we Correct. take a look at this rapid debt repayment schedule, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> you, you know, options. which would actually lower the 7%, and we'd be, you know what I, so I'm yeah, just saying, things, have, things just because things have happened one way Correct. forever does not mean that they always have to happen that way, especially if there are sound fiscal reasons to, 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 to try something new, and Absolutely. if you can test them out with the rating yeah. agencies. Yeah. Councilman Mejir? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Mejir. Um, all right, I think if we can, uh, oh, Councilor Morell, I keep forgetting you. I am so sorry. Councilor Morell, you have the floor. Yeah, I really just have one simple question, um, but I was sorry for being late, um, but I was listening on the way here, um, a lot of information to dive into, um, and I'm very interested in, you know, kind of seeing what happens to our bond rating, or do you guys forecast or can predict you know, what will happen to our bond rating if we increase, you know, the, the debt from over 7% or get to 7% or if we are aggressive in the repayment? Is there any way to forecast what will happen to our bond rating and what that will look like? Chief Starrett have mentioned that he's going to bring back those projections. And we, can we look at different uh, percentages as well? So we can, we can certainly sketch out how much we can, how much more we can access by that. What we can't really predict is how the rating agencies are going to respond. What we do know is that it would be viewed as a, a quote unquote credit negative, right? At the end of the day, there's the positives and the negatives. You borrow more, that's a negative. I don't think it would be so detrimental that I think it would affect the city's credit rating agency. I also think it's part of the overall story you're telling. And as the councilor mentioned, we would do so in a way that is proactive prior to actually changing the policy is we would have those conversations with the agencies um, to, under, to sort of sell it, right? Obviously, you're sort of saying, hey, we need, we have, we're at a, as, as the councilor mentioned, we're at a crisis of displacement in the city. We're at a crisis of climate in the city. We're at a crisis of housing in the city. We need to make investments now in order to make Boston, keep Boston competitive. Um, and we actually think that it's a bigger credit risk to not make these investments. So I think that that's the story you would, you would tell to the agencies. We can't necessarily predict though how they would react. What's the point of being so amazing if we can't help the most vulnerable, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> sorry, Council World, well, back to you. Well, are there any other, you know, cities that might not be operating as conservatives that we're doing that we can look to to say, you know, they're still maintaining a AAA bond rating, but they're operating at, you know, a higher debt or they're repaying loans faster? Is there any examples of cities that you can point to this to say that as well. There, there are definitely cities, as I, as I sort of mentioned earlier, every city's circumstances are unique, right? So maybe they pay it back less because they have to get way more aggressive on their pension because they're not as far along with us, right? So there's mm -hmm. definitely trade-offs. And I would go back to what Councillor Flynn said earlier. 
the seven percent, the, the debt policies, all of the practices that we have in the ANF cabinet long precede me, long precede us, right. and they were based really in tough times for the city in the mm -hmm. 80s and the 70s, where we were making cuts, we were laying off people, we were closing firehouses, and all of that sort of work over the intervening 40 years since Prop Two and a Half has been sort of built on that basis, and I think we are, I think we, the mayor, everyone is trying to put as many um, good ideas and put as many dollars back into investments as possible, but it's got to be done in a way that is sort of cohesive with this whole story of where we've come over the past 30 or 40 years of really good fiscal practices. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Rao. Uh, can we invite our, uh, the rest of our panelists to join in and please be, bear with us, please stay. Yeah. Um. <laughs> is he okay? Yeah. Councilor, are you okay? I'm good. I'm good. All right. <laughs> uh, anywhere you like. Yes, yeah, sit with them. Jim doesn't bite. <laughs> of course. Um, our dearest uh, Councilor Lujan would like to. Uh, you you want to introduce them? No, 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 no. You no, have no, another no, question. Chair. Yeah, I have another question, but you can. You can do Go ahead. It. Oh um, well. I just wanted to say that, you know, I appreciate the administration for being here, and it just sounds like, you know, a lot of the policies were set, as, 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 as Chief Sarah stated, prior to, to you all being here. And, and again, to echo just something I said, and, and something the chair said, what's the point of having these, all these great things to remark about the strong economy if we're not using it for the, for the most vulnerable? Um, I think about, you know, why we have, we have this property tax boom, we've had this, this development boom that has added to the deep, deep inequality in our city that is pushing out black and brown folks, black and brown folks who actually weren't even able to access jobs at the same rate at, at, during this development boom. So what I'm trying to identify is at what point in this booming economy can we actually use our resources to really do the work of equity and deep, deep investment in black and brown communities that have not been advantaged by uh, the, the housing boom and the property taxes and development, right? So is this a pressing point where we, we, part of the reason that we're doing so well as an economy and that we have this AAA bordering is because of our management, because of uh, the richness of our city. And so how is this an area where we can lean in and do a lot of the deep investments that we need to do? Um, and so I, I guess with that, I'll just ask one more question of the administration. Um, and that is, well, actually two. We didn't bond last year, it looks like, and is, is there a reason for that? We didn't issue any general obligation bonds. Is, is, there, is there a schedule on which we, we do and don't do that? Uh, so we borrow when we need the money. So as, as I think Councillor Bacher or someone else mentioned, we, we sort of are limited in, in the time period by which we can borrow. The projects actually have to be spent within three years, so we really try to borrow when projects are, are hitting the ground. Um, to uh, avoid, you know, us borrowing for something that doesn't actually come to fruition. Um, let's see, 2020, we issued at the end of 2020, and then I think just because of transitions, timing, COVID, I think the market and our advisors um, ultimately advised that we go now, and I think that that's why there was a, a couple month gap between 2021 and 2022, but um, there, was, uh, there was no sort of reason other than um, we just needed the money now as opposed to earlier. Okay, and then the last question I have is that, uh, so it looks like the uh, payment reschedule that we have for the bonds is uh, 20 years versus 30 years, and you're saying that that has been set out in a policy that we've had for a long time since the mini administration. Do you know what other comparable cities are doing? Do they do the 20 to versus 30? My last question. Um, it depends. You, you, the, the rule of thumb is you borrow for the useful life of the asset. So typically, 20 to 30 years is sort of like, you know, low end for a building. It's high end for a street tree. It's high end for a road, right? So it, it sort of depends. We, when we actually issue the bonds, we issue them in tranches. So we have five year bonds, ten year bonds, twenty year bonds. You could certainly look at going out to thirty years. That's the maximum as allowed by state law. Um, but it, it sort of is is part of our overall credit rating that we pay it back in that twenty year time period. Uh, but certainly something we could look at changing. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, We've been joined by uh, our uh, fellow counselor, Josh Zakem. <laughs> um, <f> former. <laughs> she did that. No you one ain't confusion. You saw that, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, you have a presentation for us uh, today, and also, um, sorry, Professor Benjo Benjamin um, 
if we, if I can give you the floor, you have a presentation or? Just, just verbal, no, uh, okay. no PowerPoint. So uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, thank you uh, to the sponsors, uh, Councilor Louis Jen, for the invitation. My name is Josh Zakem, uh, former city councilor here and uh, currently the executive director of Housing Forward Massachusetts, which is a nonprofit uh, housing policy advocacy organization. And I've got to say, I was very excited to hear uh, about this hearing order um, and to hear the uh, earlier testimony from the ANF folks uh, from the administration. Uh, it's exciting. It's something that we've talked about as an organization broadly uh, for some time. It's something that I think is a little known area of policy uh, for the general public and for many folks uh, in the city of Boston. And it's an important tool. And uh, what I'm going to say here, I uh, hope the ANF folks aren't too upset about being a little too aggressive. You guys do, I mean, a phenomenal job, and the city's credit rating is a testament to that. Um, but I'm going to probably ally myself a little bit with the comments from the chair uh, and the sponsor about, you know, being, being aggressive um, and using our incredible credit rating um, thoughtfully, judiciously, um, but as a way to address some of these challenges. Um, you know, as an organization, Housing Forward is very focused on increasing the production uh, of housing uh, across the Commonwealth, but obviously here we're talking about the city of Boston, and being creative with existing policy tools to do that, whether that's through zoning reform or here tapping into financial resources uh, that the city does have. And certainly the city and the Commonwealth do a lot uh, of funding affordable housing through bond issuances, um, but it's important that we do a little more about that. Um, whether it's supporting first-time home buyers uh, with mortgage loans, expanding those programs, raising some of the limits on those programs to the extent possible because while Boston does invest a lot in affordable housing, housing costs a lot of money in the city of Boston. You know, you can't really compare Boston uh, to Springfield or, you know, even to Portland. I guess you can compare us to San Francisco uh, or Los Angeles when it comes to cost, but it, it, it's a critical challenge keeping people here, making sure that we're sharing this prosperity. Boston is a prosperous, wealthy, rich city, but that is not shared. And an important way to share that prosperity is making sure folks, whether it's affordable rental housing, are able to stay here and access those resources, but just as importantly, and I think in many ways more so, is creating affordable home ownership opportunities. And that's one avenue that as an organization, uh, Housing Forward believes should be explored further whether it's tapping the city of Boston's credit, um, and again, uh, making sure that bond council, uh, I think, you know, is at the table as well to see what is allowable uh, on, in that area, make sure this is a public purpose, municipal purpose under the statutes. But let's try it. Let's, let's get creative here and see really what we can do. And doing that to make sure that folks are building wealth, that historically in this country, the best way to build wealth has been through home ownership because the cost of housing in Boston continues to rise. And while that's good from a taxation perspective, it's good from a public resources perspective, that is very challenging from a keeping people in our communities perspective, from allowing folks who are first time home buyers to participate in that growing uh, wealth and building that equity. That's really important. I also, I don't wanna go on too long, but there's one other thing I needed to talk about, and that's uh, what Ken Councilor Bach uh, has been so focused on with the fair cloth. Uh, amendment is that is so right on the money, not to use a pun here, of the kind of things that Housing Forward wants to talk about is existing policy tools that can be used more effectively and efficiently to create more housing. So I would just urge uh, in this is that looking at investing, you know, our capital dollars in creating more city-owned affordable housing to take advantage of that. That just seems like leaving money on the table for the city of Boston. Now, is it possible you're gonna create more units through other avenues? Of course. And we should be looking at all of that. But we have a federal government that has done far too little on affordable housing over the past generation or two, but does have this available resources for the city of Boston. I think that's a conversation that certainly throughout the budget process, through future meetings and hearings, uh, needs to be tapped into. And I look forward to working with you all on that. Uh, I'm happy to talk more about any of these aspects or other things, but like I said, I'm trying to keep it brief. I know we've all been here uh, a while, and this is a really 
interesting, well, it's an interesting topic to me, um, but want to keep, uh, keep things moving. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Mrs. Akum. Uh, we'll go to Professor Bradlow and then uh, for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you to the counselors. Thank you to the administration. Um, my name is Ben Bradlow, and I'm a lecturer on sociology at Harvard, uh, where I teach and research about urban political economy and comparative perspective. Along with a doctorate in sociology, I hold a master's in city planning. And I'm very glad to testify about making productive use of the city of Boston's advantageous fiscal position. What I want to emphasize today is that Boston's remarkably strong fiscal position, really remarkable given the presentation we heard today, can be protected while at the same time underwriting a much more active role in producing a more equal and inclusive city. Many of the councillors in this room, along with the mayor, have made inequality a defining theme of their or your political work. Right. Eight years of a triple A bond rating in a large American city is a terrible tool to waste in what a recent Brookings Institution report found is the seventh most unequal city in the United States. The city is currently holding debt liabilities of almost 2% below its debt service limit. This suggests that the city's budget is currently falling short of its political mandate to address inequality to the full extent afforded by the city's resources. If Boston can afford to take advantage of its fiscal position by issuing higher levels of debt up to its prescribed debt service limit, this deserves serious consideration, and the fact of this hearing is a very positive sign. Surely this council should consider what social gains could be realized in exploiting the city's fiscal space without lo losing the borrowing advantages of the city's current bond rating. Amid a real estate market boom, the displacement of the city's poor and working class grows. The last election was fought largely on the question of whether the city government is in a position to make a difference in the deepening scourge of housing unaffordability. And the need to preserve and develop housing is a critical role that a city in Boston's fiscal position is well positioned to take. New types of institutional mechanisms can drive such an agenda forward. In particular, I want to suggest that a key goal should be the development of social housing, including for rent. By social housing, I simply mean housing that is outside of the market. Another term for this is decommodified housing. This approach could take the form of what a group of researchers and activists nationwide, based out of New York University's Urban Democracy Lab, have proposed as a social housing development authority. The basic idea here is that a social housing development authority would acquire distressed real estate assets, mostly mortgages, and or deploy existing public assets towards the production of non-market housing. The goal is to develop a type of land bank that would be in the city's control to develop both new and existing housing stock outside of the private real estate market. A social housing development authority would assist in financing the acquisition and development of these properties in partnership with the remarkably rich and diverse social housing sector that exists in the city. This sector includes community land trusts, cooperatives, and a range of other nonprofit organizations. This may also be, uh, this most may also hold potential for partnership with the Boston Housing Authority, as some have alluded to already today. A first step towards establishing this kind of model could be that the city deploys its existing debt financing capacity to guarantee acquisitions of distressed assets directly by the social housing sector outside of the city. This would be a middle ground approach that would have the advantage of being less risky for the city. It would also have the disadvantage of lacking the full convening and fiscal authority of the Boston city government. What would necessarily begin at a small scale would take longer to scale up. And Councillor Bach has already alluded to the need and challenge of scale in the housing question in Boston. A municipal social housing development authority would function as a form of a municipal finance facility for anti-displacement and housing production. Its focus would be on rental housing. There are many important economic benefits to home ownership, which we've just heard about. We are in a moment of unprecedented reliance on the rental market in U.S. history. The displacement crisis in Boston 
as in many cities and towns across the country, is driven through the growing unaffordability of rents. This means that reaching the people most at risk requires intervening directly in this sector. Doing so would also guarantee predictable returns. If combined with existing federal grants for housing and blended with financing for more traditional infrastructure within the city's portfolio of debt obligations, this would be a fiscally, a fiscally secure and socially innovative institution. Further, the city's proposed real estate transfer fee would be a very relevant form of revenue to combine with the debt obligation associated with the Municipal Social Housing Development Authority. The NYU-based initial proposal in late 2020 for this kind of authority was conceived as a federal agency. But a city like Boston is extremely well positioned from both a political and fiscal perspective to act at the municipal level even without innovation forthcoming from our federal government. The sale of the city's first green and social bonds last year met with strong demand, as we've heard. Like non-market housing, these bonds support infrastructure that has traditionally not been valued on open markets for debt. With the continued growth of global investment portfolios focused on environmental, social, and governance factors, also known as ESG, creditworthy municipal governments should continue to see the kind of demand that Boston experienced last year. This is likely to be even more of a dominant dynamic in a world that faces growing financial risks along with an increased interest in financing decarbonization and addressing inequality. In, in other words, there's a story to tell. I want to emphasize what this means for how we understand the problems of eviction and eviction risk in the city. These are not only problems that can or should be addressed through legal protections during and after an eviction proceeding. Cities need to be proactive in developing solutions that can prevent evictions from becoming pre so prevalent in the first place. The root cause lies in the unsuitability of renting on the open market today in Boston for the full range of income types. This requires taking distressed assets off the market precisely by using the city's advantageous position as has been evaluated by the market and investing in the social infrastructure of the city to provide for its people. I'm not suggesting that this proposal has no risks, but there's a strong political consensus in this city among many of the councillors seated here, the mayor, unions, activist organizations, academics, and many business leaders that the city's current social trajectory carries its own immense risks. The social worlds of wealthy American cities are once again becoming sites of intense segregation and displacement. Robust institutional responses are required at the city scale. Given its fiscal position, a city like Boston can't realistically say that it can only sit back and manage a set of circumstances that are beyond its control. Historically, American cities have lagged well behind many of their counterparts across the rich world as well as in some middle-income countries in developing municipally run and financed institutions to address the challenge of housing exclusion and displacement. Boston's fiscal position makes it possible for the city to become a leader in showing that municipalities can begin to take control of the injustice of displacement and housing insecurity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bradlow. Um, Councillor Bach uh, has to leave soon, so we'll, uh, Councillor Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, for your indulgence, and, and my sincere apologies to all the panelists. I, six months ago, said I would be at something at noon today. Um, but uh, I just, I really want to thank you, Professor, for those comments. Um, thank Councillor Zakem for um, becoming one of our frequent flyers here, um, my predecessor. Uh, and just, you know, connecting this to the hearing we had a few weeks ago that Councillor Zakem was at about the Boston Redevelopment Authority. I just, before I leave, I want to stress the fact that I think there's, it is an extraordinary fact that in the city of Boston, we actually currently have all of the competencies to have a social housing development authority without any changes in law. We actually have the capacity to do these things through the combination of the existing legal powers of both the Boston Redevelopment Authority and the Boston Housing Authority. I think that we have capital budget room within a responsible fiscal policy and a narrative that I think would be uh, understandable to the rating agencies. I think that we have the political will. The reality is that when we did go to the ballot in 2016 on the Community Preservation Act, we saw a 74% yes vote. 
which is comparable to the 74, 71% yes votes that these cities out west are getting for their bond offerings. Um, sadly, the scale of, of what we've, you know, CPA has been huge and it's brought a bunch to the table, but it's just not at the same scale of what we need to be talking about. Um, and then, as I mentioned already, we have this federal authority and the alignment of a few federal programs in a way that didn't exist even a few years ago. Um, so I think the, the real thing that I want to stress before departing is that it seems to me like there actually is an alignment of resources, will, and then like technical and legal capacity in the city of Boston such that we really could move into a new space with the creation of social housing. And, and, I, and I wanna underscore that there are places elsewhere in the world um, where you know that, that description social housing is used to indicate that the public could own housing that is not only for the deeply, extremely low income, although the only way we're gonna get that is through this federal support. Um, but that actually, like, even if we're building moderate income housing, that there's a real argument for public ownership of that. Um, you can, you know, that you can do a, a partnership on management, but um, it allows us to talk about something that we could actually bond for. So I just want to stress that I, I feel like all these pieces can come together in the city of Boston. Um, and and before I leave, just uh, again thank Chief Sterrett because I think this is likely to be his last hearing in front of us. Um, and I know that uh, if he were staying. Um, he would be a part of the team figuring out how we put all these pieces together um, as he has been on so many uh, fronts of moving the ball forward. And, and I, I do just really want to stress, you know, this is a council that is uh, uh, impatient to figure out how we do these big picture things. A lot, of the, a lot of the seeds for our capacity to do these big picture things have been planted over the last few years um, and including under the leadership of the folks who are before us. So I just, um, I, I, I never want you to mistake that um, impatience with a non-recognition of all the work done. I think it's just like it would be so exciting for Boston to just jump forward and lean on this. So grateful to my co-sponsors, uh, Councillor Louis-Jean and Councillor Anderson, and I am so sorry to have to um, go, but some people will be very angry at me if I don't. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Councillor Bach. Um, thank you, uh, Councillor Bach, for those comments. Also want to, my deep, deep gratitude to Professor Bradlow for uh, your great remarks uh, to help push us forward in how we're thinking about housing and addressing the housing crisis. And of course, um, you know, uh, former city councilor, councilor Zake, I'm not sure which title you want, but for being here and, and, and having us think both about home ownership and about rental, right? Oftentimes we think about these things in opposition and in tension when we can actually, to have a thriving city, we need both. We need to be creating those wealth opportunities and not everyone is there and not everyone wants to be there. And we also need to be creating these great uh, rental opportunities. Um, I, I really like Councilor Zakem and you alluded to this too, Professor Bradlow, this idea that we are in a prosperous city. And to Councilor Bach's point, we're all really, I'm happy, I'm jazzed that we have a AAA bond rating. It's something that we should be happy and, and, and proud about. But again, it's about leaning into that, to, the, to that strength to make sure that it's a shared prosperity. That, that's something that I, I care deeply about um, to really target the issues of inequity. I was hoping, um, uh, 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 Councillor Zakem, that you could talk a bit more about uh, the home ownership, the ways that we can uh, use our fiscal strength for home ownership a bit more, if you had any ideas. Um, I'm always actually someone who's very interested in what other cities are doing. Uh, to target the problem. So if you have that comparative lens and uh, Professor Bradlow, if you have examples of other, you know, cities either here or abroad that are doing social housing in a way that we want to, would want to explore. Thank you. Th thank you, Councillor. Um, so one, I think that's really important and, and I believe a few folks have mentioned this is layering the different programs and resources we have to address the problem. So, Yes, you know, the city has the one plus mortgage program. We have down payment assistance. The state has some pretty aggressive and impactful programs, but given the high cost and the high need here uh, in the city of Boston is that, you know, you can't, you're not gonna find a lot that's at the half a million dollar range for housing, particularly for a family in the city of Boston. And when you have limits on these programs, they're, Obviously there's a reason, there's a necessity, you wanna make sure that there's as much access as possible. But looking at ways to layer additional assistance to expand either the number there that allows folks to buy a home or even just the number of folks who are being served by that, I think is really important. I think looking at one aspect of using our borrowing authority uh, and the city's balance sheet to finance some of that, I think is important. 
I do also want to say, while I am always talking about the combination of home ownership opportunities, increased rental affordability, when we're talking about you know bonding authority, I do think it's important to focus on you know sort of the capital investment, and and that goes back to I think you know Councilor Bach and the rest of the body here have been talking about creating more housing, and it goes to Professor Bradlow's comment as well is purchasing distressed assets, um, and the city has hundreds of parcels already you know on the city's rolls that have been taken through. Uh, tax for tax delinquencies um, that need to be looked at. A lot of them are small and probably not suitable for the kind of things we're talking about, but they're there, using the powers of the Boston Planning and Development Agency to do that. Uh, and the technical capabilities to do something like this is really important. But I also just want to reiterate, and I, I know I'm all over because I'm always thinking of every aspect and how we can do this and that. When we're talking, though, about for, for these purposes here, for this hearing, I do think it's about investment in new units, whether it's purchasing um, or building, because one, from a bonding perspective, you know, you have the one-time capital investment, and particularly where we have federal funds that would allow for the management and operations of those units under the Faircloth Amendment. I, I do want to just sort of refocus uh, on that and just being as efficient as we can with creating more units. Thank you. Professor? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Lujan. Um, you know, there, there, there are a wide range of cases around the world, but I, I want to start in responding to your question by focusing in on the case at home here in the U.S. And we've already discussed that there's a significant capacity in Boston to be investing in public housing that the city is uh, already under the, the Faircloth Amendment limit. So, you know, public housing in the U.S. is a form of social housing. We shouldn't treat the, the concept of social housing as something that's, that's uh, you know, uh, a foreign import a, as an idea. Um, there, there's a lot of scope to be investing in the existing programs of uh, public or social housing, non-market housing, um, in under the, the U.S. institutional structure. What I do want to note is that in, over time, in a number of northern European cities, um, investments in social housing have moved both poor working class and middle class uh, residents into the non-market housing sector. You have vast swaths of a number of large North, northern European cities who are living in social housing, who are not subject to the kinds of shifts in the housing market that America that make these crazy boom-bust cycles and crises of displacement in American cities. Um, so you, that's when the question of scale comes in. That's further down the road. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Council Mayor, do you have a question? Yeah. I don't so much have a question, Madam Chair. I just have a comment. Mm -hmm. Is that cool? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Let me make sure. Um, so, you know, I've, I've said this in other spaces around the fact that we have so many people that have been displaced, um, many of which are ending up in Brockton, Randolph, Stoughton, but yet still have to commute here <laughs> to work. Um, and the financial burden that the displacement that we have been, um, I would say, accountable for, you know, have continued to impact residents here in the city of Boston. And I'm just curious, um, you know, I'm, I'm just struggling with this because I'm just wondering how many people over the last eight years since we've been toting the fact that we have this AAA bonding rating for the last eight years, is that what I heard? Um, at what cost has that come when we look at the return on the investment or lack of investment on, on the quality of life of folks who have been displaced people who can no longer afford to live here. And at some point, we as a city need to grapple with that sense of responsibility and accountability that we have in many ways in, in, in the desire to toot this AAA bonding, have literally um, financially created abuse in many ways for folks who can no longer afford to, to live here. So I just kind of want to state that for the record and just be really adamant about the fact that if we're really serious about righting the wrong, this is an opportunity for us to redirect 
and to be super intentional about investing in what is going to, I believe, keep people here, Bostonians here, low-income communities here in the city of Boston. And I think that that is our um, call to action. And I think, um, you know, I always talk about growing up here in the city of Boston. I bounced from place to place. And it wasn't at, until I was in the fifth grade that I had a place that I can call to have my own room. And that I was able to stay in one space long enough to make friends. And so that impact, I think we have to think about, it's not just about the housing, but it's also about the families and the students and the disruption that we're causing. Um, so this is such, this is much bigger than just uh, the, the, the impact that this could make, Justin, and I know you're leaving, but the impact that this could make will improve the quality of life for all of our families, not just in the housing space, but I think um, being able to, there are people who work at Boston Public Health Commission that can't even afford to live in the city of Boston. Um, there are people who are students and, and have to finagle and lie <laughs> oftentimes to be able to stay within the housing lease of their, you know, with their families so that they can afford to, so they can stay here in the city of Boston. So this is not a moment for us to just have really great lip service. This is really a moment for us to, the professor's um, point, this is our mandate. And this is now an opportunity for us to match our political will with political courage to do what is this moment calling for. And that is to lean in um, and, and move this conversation forward. And I'm glad that Councillor Bach really made the point, or I don't know who made the point, but whoever it was, kudos to you, about the fact that we already have all of the tools, the resources, and the laws put in place for us to be able to do this. The question is, why haven't we? And more importantly, what are we waiting for? And that's not, that's a rhetorical question, I think is what they call it in America. It's not a question. Unless you feel the need to answer it, I'm here for it. But if not, it's all good. Thank you, Councilor Mejia. Um, beautifully said. Councilor Worrell? Uh, yeah, no question. But um, thank you, Councilor Zakum, and thank you, Professor Bradlow. And just kind of echoing what Julia said is, you know, we have the resources, we have the tools, we have the opera dollars, we have the credible bond rating. Um, I think now is the time to make sure that the investments you know, in affordable housing, in services are coming into neighborhoods that have been disinvested, overlooked for far too long. Um, and it seems like we have the political willpower now, so it's all about doing it. So just wanted to say that for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rowe. Um, and, I, and I don't know, I was just some thoughts that I was just starting down, but I don't know if this is who can answer this for me. But in regards to other financial options um, to fund affordable housing, if the assessed value for new developments are based on construction costs and not initial prices. And um, we're, we're talking about like basically, um, this means that new growth um, revenue will radically be under assessed, right? So like, for example, the city is missing out on alleged benefits for luxury development. Um, if you look at Millennial Towers as an example, the total average price, I think it was like two million per unit for 440 units. Um, and that's per unit. Um, and construction cost was 600 like K per unit or something like that. Um, or new growth was brought it up to 600 um, per unit. And so, oh, 600 K per unit. The su then subsequently the sales price when reassessed um, would not be counted as new growth and thus the, so added baseline, but simply push up against a two and a half percent limit, effectively lowering the tax bills for everyone else, residential and commercial. The city would then be missing out on a huge amount of this new revenue. Um, and I'm, I guess I'm thinking about over decades um, on the luxury un units, which are arguably driving up rents and sales prices um, citywide. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm trying to figure out how the assessments work 
or how is it done? Um, and are there any opportunities to increase revenue and additional funds to dedicate to sustain and creating more affordable housing? So if we're making money there, can we sustain can we sustain it with bonds or can we do less bonds or is there a way to couple that money together? I think you just press and wait. Okay, great, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, so we, so it's a great question. We are somewhat limited in how we assess new growth based on state law. So the State Department of Revenue dictates how and when we can sort of determine how much to um, tax or assess a new property. So we could certainly look into state law change around that. The, the assessing department does revalue it every property every two years and five years, and that's where we'll look at the sales price of it, and we'll look at corresponding sales of other units in, in the area or in the neighborhood or in the zip code, um, so that the taxes for those units get made whole eventually. Um, to your question about the overall levy limit, though, you are correct. We don't raise values or we don't raise taxes on an aggregate level at the same rate by which we raise the overall um, appraised value of the properties, right? So when you're looking at a aggregate of everybody, we go up two and a half percent, that's what we're capped at, and that's what the council approves on an annual basis. But values, both on the commercial side for a long time and certainly on the residential side, far exceed that from an annual perspective. So we, as a city, and it's good, you know, I know it doesn't necessarily create as much revenue locally, but our taxes compared to many of our brother and sister communities around us are actually pretty low compared on, a, on an actual basis, which is good for homeowners and good for people who live here and people who um, have lived here for a long time and get the residential exemption. It does limit our upside. The only way to supersede that is something that the city has not ever, to my knowledge, pursued, which would be a Prop 2.5 override, is basically exceeding that annual appropriation, or sorry, that e annual levy limit um, in order to assess more on properties. Thank you. Um, I, don't, I don't have uh, questions at this time, but Maureen. I just, Did I'm sorry. Did Maureen? Maureen? I see your mic. Oh, no, okay. I didn't. It was always lit. Okay. Thank you. Mic. Um, thank you, assistant. <laughs> My vice chair. Um, I, I guess, you know, I, I always like to just simplify it for myself in, in, how I, in terms of how I um, explain things to my kids, right? We, so we can borrow more money, but it means that we might be able to pay it longer or more interest, so that's the risk. Uh, there's definitely the possibility, because we're doing so great, so great that we can pay it in five to 10 years in an aggressive way, right? Um, we're so rich that we have all of these resources at our fingertips. We're so amazing, but we have people suffering and dying. It's kind of weird, right? So it's, it's, the idea then is, okay, if this is possible, and we know how, and there are tools, then why are we doing it? And I think that's what we're all saying, it, saying here today. And I think you guys agree um, I think you're saying, we're gonna do this job, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're gonna do this job and we, our job is assessing risk and preventing risk, or at least try to, right, um, take as less, the least as possible. And we, and I respect that. And Justin, you're phenomenal at, at this job and we, we will miss you. Um, and so, but, for Jim and those who are staying, it sounds like we're about to make some huge changes. It sounds like we, it sounds like that's what we got here, right? I mean, um, what, what do you have to say about that? No, I mean, I think, I think that's right. I think the goal of what, and, and so many people have said it, we have the political will, we have the legal framework, we have counselors and a mayor with this ambitious agenda of really realizing the deep inequities in our city uh, that have been here for decades, that my parents who came here with nothing have lived and are still working class family, would not be able to live here, would not be able to afford anything here um, if, you know, if this is when they were trying to make it in this city. Um, and it's about how do we match what is a strong, stable economy because of the schools, because of people want to stay here. And I want everyone I want everyone who comes to school here and lands a great job in the life sciences or in the healthcare industry 
to be able to stay here and find a job, but not, but not to the point where we're pushing out families who want to be able to call, call Boston home. We get these heart-wrenching emails from folks mm -hmm. who were born and raised in this city, who are black and brown, who are just trying to make it, who are social workers, who are teachers and can't afford to live here. So, I mean, the, the purpose of this is for us to say that we can, we can do more and that we should be doing more. And that, you know, these deep investments by the city in our, whether it is a social housing development authority or, you know, leaning on to, leaning uh, into our uh, fiscal strength and, and doing more for homeowners, um, none of it has to be completely disruptive of a private market. Um, and if there's one question that I had left for, uh, for Josh and for Professor Bradlow is like, how does this, these deep investments that we make in housing or in our schools and public investments, the, if you could talk about either the return on investment for an economic sense and a social sense and how that relates to the private market. Thanks. So uh, thank you, Councillor. So you make a really good point. This would not net be, need to be disruptive at all of the private market. Uh, it is my view that when we're talking about low-income housing or very low-income, there needs to be government intervention to create the supply to keep families and individuals housed. I do believe, and this is sort of what we talked about at the, the hearing last week about making use of other resources, that there is a way through zoning and regulatory reform to really address more of the middle of the market needs, absolutely. But what we're talking about here city owning housing or investing in affordable housing or providing additional vouchers or whatever economic financial support we want to provide here can only help, in my view, the broader housing market, the broader economy uh, of the city of Boston. So let's, uh, let's go forward. And, I, and I, I'm apologizing again to the ANF folks because I know they are so not looking for any more borrowing or more risk and that's, that's absolutely you know, reasonable, no, I, but. If, if you don't mind, I, I think we agree. I think there is a tremendous amount of need and I think there is a tremendous amount of desire to do more. We are still in the infancy, really as a city in investing in housing, right? Mm -hmm. It was only three years ago, Councillor, I think you were here when we did our first housing vouchers, yep. which took decades before, before we actually I, got there. It took a long time. I think myself and, <laughs> and the current mayor were the original co-sponsors of the first hearing on yeah. that. Yeah. And, and we're really only near two or three of investing in the Boston Housing Authority, whether it's for the redevelopment of those units and, and hopefully generating more, I think, as we've, we've talked about, or just the preservation of them because they need to be upgraded, stuff like Mildred mm -hmm. Haley. I think you're going to see a mayor who's going to continue to invest deeply in that in, in all the types of buckets, whether it's the operating budget, whether it's federal funding, whether it's um, capital dollars, but it is a, it's a, it's a tool in the tool belt and it's got to be everything. It can't just be sort of one. So if you see any reservation from us, it's not because we don't share, and I don't think this administration shares the deep desire to do more in all of those areas. It's just, there's a tremendous amount of need and it's going to be about working with the council to prioritize amongst all those different needs. Yeah. You know, I know Councillor Flynn is, um, has left, but how do we invest more in schools? How do we invest more in housing? How do we invest more in climate? It's all about balancing those priorities. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Councilman here, did you have a oh, comment? No, I, think, I think Professor Bradley. Oh, Professor Bradley? Press and stop. Release. And wait, 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 wait. wait, wait. <laughs> it's going to come on. Yeah. Um, I, I'm struck just on the question of what is or isn't disruptive to the market. I'm struck by um, the, the finance team's incredible presentation where the one main risk that I heard was that is precisely housing on affordability is actually the main economic risk to the city. So to the extent that anything threatens the market in Boston, it's precisely the incapacity of the city or, or so far lack of investment in the city to deal with housing on affordability. This is, you know, not, not every investment that a municipal government makes is or should be entirely functional to the market. The city is responsible for a whole range of public goods that were enumerated in these various pie charts, taking up most of the, the sections of the pie charts that we saw today, um, including and especially public education is, is done outside of the market. Um, but I'm struck that even if on a market basis, these kinds of investments that we're discussing are entirely functional to this discussion. Great, thank you. Councilman here. 
Thank you. Um, I wanted to just thank my, my esteemed, I always forget all of these parliamentary, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 but wanted to thank you, thank you. Councillor um, Sakem, for, for joining us here again, and you um, as well, Professor. Um, and, you know, I think I just want to underscore again um, that we don't have the luxury to keep on waiting, right? Um, I think we keep hearing the same thing, and very, it's like molasses, the trickle down economics and waiting for Superman to arrive, and when he does, he forgets the cape. Right, and so <laughs> there's nothing, there's no real progress um, made. And, and I really do think, um, and I have to just, I know that we're gonna be entering budget season and we're gonna hear a lot about all of these competing interests, but I do think that if you are housed, then you could find employment. If you are housed, you know, it impacts your mental health and wellness. I mean, it, like, it's a no brainer. Um, and I just wanna underscore that I am in full support of what this um, work will look like. And I look forward to all the budget hearings that are coming down the pipeline so that we can have these conversations. So thank you um, all for, for being here. And I don't, that's, that's my closing remark. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Council Mejia. I, I'll go to my, um, actually to the panel if you have any final remarks before we no, I just want to thank both the, the maker and, and the committee for sponsoring the hearing and the other panelists for being here. It, it is a shared priority. I totally agree, Councillor. It is fundamental to what we do, and I think you'll see a proposal by this mayor next week that reflects that type of urgency and that type of commitment as a core fundamental tenant of her priorities is investing in housing across all the different types of avenues, operating, capital, and federal. I just want, I, thank you. Um, this, this conversation is really important because, you know, as again, as counselors, we are called on to approve um, and to authorize, um, but there's a lot more behind that that we gotta understand because our residents are calling us and asking us to make sure that we're doing more. And so, um, you know, I took a, you know, a, a local finance class in uh, grad school, mostly ran late to it all the time, but I, I do understand that we have this power, right? That we, this is strength. Um, and our strong economy is our responsibility to make sure that that prosperity is shared. And so, um, you know, I know that folks in ANF tend to be protective of your area and you all are the experts when it comes to balancing the budget and making sure that we are being strong fiscal stewards. But there's also a, a call in there to make sure that our residents are taken care of in a moment of deep, deep, deep inequality. And so this is just, you know, peeking behind the curtain to see what we can do. And there's, this is a place where I think there's a lot more that we can do to respond to the urgency. So the conservatism that we've had for years that has led to this uh, prosperity needs to also um, address, be used urgently to address the issues that we have as a city. And so I just thank you all for being here. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, and hopefully we're able to, to, to marry the, the, the strength of the city with the urgency of the issues at hand. So I just thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you, Council Lujan. Um, it's exciting, the prospect of utilizing our municipal bonds, isn't it? It's super exciting. I mean, the only thing that it conflicts a little bit minor, um, obviously it's with my own personal beliefs. I also uh, practice uh, something in my personal life that um, limits me to how much um, risk I take <laughs> on um, interest. So I'm, I'm with you on this in terms of not setting us up. Um, I'd be very interested to see what our mayor, um, what the prospect is on that. Um, and uh, looking forward to, I'm sure we're going to be supporting it. Uh, and then I'm sure we're gonna be asking her for more. <laughs> and then, uh, I thank you all for being here. Uh, wonderful presentation, everyone. Um, and thank you so much to uh, the original co-sponsor, my original co-sponsor, and I look forward to seeing uh, Ms. Garceau and Jim very soon. Um, and uh, Chief, I bid you adieu. <laughs> Till next time then. All right, uh, and if uh, there are no one, no one signed up for public testimony, so um, this meeting's adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>